Mr. Mancini. Good morning, Your Honor. Your Honors. Um, this uh, case uh, is one of a petition for review of an order of the Board of Immigration Appeals, a single member uh, order consisting of three paragraphs. Uh, it is the position of the petitioner that that order, <clears throat> that decision and order is incorrect for three reasons, <clears throat> um, which I will reverse, but nevertheless. Um, the first argument in favor of a reversal, I believe, <clears throat> is there the case of Perinage, which has been briefed and uh, forms a large part of our argument. The court, uh, Board of Immigration, the single member of the board, quotes uh, as follows, as noted by the immigration judge, the respondent has identified no legal authority supporting equitable tolling of the deadline of Section 245I of the Act. The respondent and then contradicts herself by saying the respondent relies upon Perinage versus Mukasey, which is indeed ample authority for the position which we're taking, which is that <clears throat> Perinage does allow precisely the relief we're asking for, which is equitable tolling of the statute Section 245I of the Act on the basis of ineffective assistance of counsel. The uh, Perinage is only partially quoted, well, actually not quoted, but referred to here. Uh, the board member says the Perinage court only declined to address whether ineffective assistance of counsel could serve as a basis for equitable tolling. That's not what happened. The, um, the panel actually said, until the question of Perinage... said the less we said about this, the better. That's correct. No, they said they're giving the board the opportunity to make the initial determination, which I think is, is proper, but it says mute pro tunc. It doesn't say they were never going to go back to the issue. It was remanded for the purpose of addressing the question of whether the equitable tolling should be allowed. But that's not what happened. When it got back to the BIA, the BIA, in fact, said, consistent with the Second Circuit's order, we hereby remand this matter to the immigration judge to make the additional factual and legal determinations mandated by the Second Circuit. Upon remand, the parties should also address whether ineffective assistance of counsel may constitute an exception to the April 30, 2001 statutory deadline in Section 245I of the Immigration Nationality Act. We deny the Department of Homeland Security's motion for a limited remand and return jurisdiction over these proceedings to the immigration judge. At the remand back to the immigration judge, the Department of Homeland Security adjusted Mr. Piranage with no written opinion, and the judge, there's, there's no, there's nothing but an adjustment. So the issue was not decided. The court, the Second Circuit, would not have remanded this case if it believed that there was a statute of repose involved because what would be the point of a Lozada determination when there was no equitable relief available anyway? I thought the way they were looking at it was what's the point of deciding the issue because there may not be an ineffective assistance problem here. I mean, don't courts generally try to do as little, <laughs> do as, little as possible, sounds wrong, but you know what I mean, not decide big questions unnecessarily. Uh, true, Your Honor, but I think the pro tunc is an important bit of Latin there. I don't think they're going to leave it, let it go, uh, because this issue has not been decided I mean, it, in, our, in, the, in this circuit, yes. We may just differ on sort of the import of what happened in the Second Circuit, but here we are in the Fourth Circuit. And I guess I'm saying I just look at this statute, and it sure looks like a statute of repose. It's not, you know, it's a date certain. It's not sort of a, a variable date depending on the happening of certain events. So what's the, explain to me, putting the Second Circuit to one side, why this looks to you like a statute of limitations. Uh, yes, Your Honor, I will, that's part of the argument as well, and it has to be. Um, it, I do not believe it is a statute of repose. I believe it is a statute of limitations for two good reasons, I hope. One is that it's not it, it, uh, the, the service, the um, government briefs call it and I, a um, hard date statute, one which ex admits of no, it's a deliberate statutory date certain deadline without any other qualifications, considerations or variables. I don't think that's true. The purpose of this act was ameliorative. It was remedial. 
it was to be an exception to the general rule of non-adjustability for section two for under section 245A. It's it's not a, it's not supposed to be construed with anything other than quote flexibility in this issue. The I don't think the fact that a date appears is the determinative at least the cases that I was that I read is not the determinative of whether it's a statute of repose versus a statute of limitations. There are as as the Harris court said there's no bright line rule it, it doesn't exist because this is an import from equity and equity is to be done but if you look at the Supreme Court's uh, ruling in Brockamp which is in the briefs a tax statute setting forth a limitation in unusually emphatic form expressly stating that time barred actions shall be considered erroneous did not permit equitable tolling this doesn't say that Mr. Mancini the fact that the statute is intended to be ameliorative um, is, it, is it really the end of the inquiry um, if, as I understand it, Congress giveth and Congress can take it away? I mean, these, this was the end of um, treating a class of individuals affirmatively, specially. Was it not? Um, Your Honor, yes, Congress can give and Congress can take away within the parameters of the Constitution. Right. Well, so you're not arguing that is this a constitutional issue? The, there's a Fifth Amendment That's right, right to. Oh yeah, most definitely, Your Honor. Um, but the language doesn't seem to suggest that it is. Is there langu language in the statute itself, of, apart from? the way you think we should construe similar statutes that support your argument that there is flexibility built in? No, Your Honor, there is only a lack of language. Um, for instance, in the Carrillo case in the Ninth Circuit, they looked at the DV, diversity lottery statute. That statute says, shall, and uses the word, only be, be the only method of obtaining a visa under that particular statute. This doesn't use the word only. Does it, but it uses on or before. It does, and that's a date. But that's not, it is our position that the use of a date is not in and of itself determinative whether it's a statute of limitation or a statute of repose. So what makes it then a statute of limitations? I haven't really heard you articulate why. You've said why you don't think it's a statute of repose, but that doesn't necessarily mean why it's a statute of limitations. Well, I... My understanding of the of the cases is that it has to be one or the other. So tell us why then it's a statute of limitations so we can process the information. Well, it if it's if it doesn't meet the definition of a statute of, of repose, it was a, it is a statute of limitations. A certain action must be taken by a certain by a certain date. That's the definition of a statute of limitations, or action commenced by a certain date. But that is forgivable. No, that I'm sorry, you said that's an in indicative of a statute of limitations? Yes, Your Honor. I'm far more familiar with statutes of limitations running for two years or three years or whatever past a certain event, which may or may not even be an event certain. It could be from the time when uh, a party realizes he or she has a cause of action. Uh, yes, Your Honor. As I said, this these terms, although we're here in an immigration law case, are imports not just from equity, but from tort. Almost every reported case is a question of tort law, and it involves questions that you have just, except for Harris. I'm running out of time. But the, um, the, except for Harris, which was involved the AEDPA, which was found to be a statute of limitations and not a statute of repose by this court. And that, I think, was, was absolutely correct. Um, and that was one year. I have a question about the legislative history. Um I mean, if we thought that the, it was ambiguous, the language as to which it was, the legislative history seems to indicate that Congress sort of thought about this problem, and the solution they proposed was that maybe um, INS should consider that it would take applications if they came in before the April 30th sunset, sunset date. They referred to it as a sunset date. 
um, even if they didn't already have all the supporting material, and then maybe allow for the supporting material to come in a little bit later. Doesn't that suggest that Congress actually intended this thing to operate as a pretty hard cutoff, at least for the original application? Yes, Your Honor, that was one of the suggestions. That was Senator Kennedy's suggestion. But my, my point is that the con congressional intent, if that's what your question, if, if that's what Congress intended, it is still subject to, my understanding, to IAC, ineffective assistance of counsel claim, because if, there's no remedy at law. There is only a, an equitable remedy involved here. He, this man can't go after Earl David in a matter of a sumset. I mean, there's no point in trying to get his $5,000 back. There's only an equitable remedy, and that's equitable tolling, but that would, in effect, give him his Fifth Amendment rights back, a la Piranesh. I'm sorry, have you, are, we make, are you making a different argument now? I am moved on to... Can, 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 can I ask you to stick with the old argument? Doesn't the legislative, as I read the legislative history, if there were any ambiguity on the face of the statute, the legislative history would sort of clear up that this was intended as a statute of repose and not a statute of limitations? I, I don't know, Your Honor. I, I, the, the only thing there is is Senator Kennedy's remark. You've quoted part of it just now. I, I, I'm aware of no statute where the... Uh, maybe this is wrong. No statute where the, where the legislature has said this is to, except for the one I gave you, this is to be treated as a statute of repose or not a statute of limitations or vice versa. Excuse me, um, what about the fact that Congress acted three times to extend the statutory cutoff? I mean, doesn't that suggest that it intended to retain complete control over the parameters of the class that is entitled to relief under the provision? That, that may be the case, Your Honor, but I, if I may go back to the argument that I started, but I, which, which is that, that congressional intent is certainly important in this, in this matter, but it doesn't, it doesn't reach the issue of whether or not that can still be waived, equi excuse me, equitably told, uh, told, because that power remains it's my understanding, in, in uh, any court under the Judicature Act of 1873. So courts, in your view, have the authority to allow equitable tolling under a statute of repose? I believe that they do, yes, Your Honor, under these circumstances. Well, then what's the difference between a statute of limitations and a statute of repose, in your view? The, the difference, in my view, is connected to the ineffective assistance of counsel. I, I should footnote what I just said in this manner, which is what I said is only true where there has been effective assistance of counsel and not otherwise. So that's the only reason that would be a carve out to the general principle that statutes of repose. Correct, Correct Your Honor. That's, that is my belief of the, in my belief reading the precedent decisions. Courts have an inherent authority to prescribe, prescribe equitable tolling to a statute of repose, notwithstanding the plain language of the Congress and adopted. I believe that the court has that, an Article Three, Section 2 court has that power, sitting in all cases of law and equity. Thank you very much, Mr. Mancini. We will now hear from Mr. Bocchini. Did I correctly pronounce that? Thank you. May it please the Court, Walter Bocchini for the Department of Justice. Um, I try not to be a point, Your Honor, but the Court should deny this petition for review. Why don't you respond to counsel's last argument? believe that courts have the inherent authority to grant equitable tolling in a statute of repose, contrary to the plain language of the statute, if found it to have plain language? Well, I believe that there is a precedent in this court, in Supreme Court, that says otherwise. Uh, courts cannot go against the intent, congressional intent of Congress when it is clear 
And it is clear here because the, this Congress did create a date certain deadline independent of any variable that is a, sub, that is a uh, precondition for eligibility for adjustment of status under this 1255I provision. And those are characteristics of statute of repose and they're not subject to equitable tolling. I think that's been recognized in every circuit and the Supreme Court. So I, that, that's how I would respond to that, to that question, Your Honor. Can I ask you, are there any um, regulatory exceptions to the sunset date? I mean, are, are there, I understand there are no statutory exceptions, but I just, I'm not that familiar with all of the regulations. There are no regulatory exceptions. Not that I'm aware of, Your Honor. There are, it's, a, it is, it's always been treated by a hard deadline, okay. and including in the legislative history, as, as Your Honor picked up. Um, so it, so it, given that it's at the hard deadline, it's clear that it's statute of repose. We don't have a lot of statutes that, create, that do have an actual uh, date certain deadline on it. And I would argue that that is the clearest kind of the statute of repose, the, the strongest indication that the, there is one, um, because it is so independent and reflects the pub public policy of Congress to cut off a very limited kind of benefit that was created um, back in 2000, or rather extended, because it has, it has been extended before by Congress. And that again points to it being a statute of repose. As, there is, as it is a statute of repose, there can be no equitable tolling, and the court should deny this petition for review. Um, and unless the court has further questions, um, we'll rest on my briefs. Just a quick question. Um, yes, Ron. So assuming that there is no equitable tolling, is there any discretionary relief available to Mr. Prasad? I mean, it is a pretty sympathetic case, right? He seems to have missed this deadline through no fault of his own, and his lawyer seems mm -hmm. effectively disbarred now. Um, he's undergoing cancer treatment. Is, I, is there some other avenue he can pursue? Or is this a uh, well, Your Honor, um, I did reach out to counsel in this case with respect to prosecutorial discretion, and he indicated that he wished to proceed forward with the case because he is, in the end, uh, uh, pursuing a much greater benefit than he could get under the President's executive authority or the DHS's uh, prosecutorial discretion. He wants to adjust the status, which means that he could uh, be able to petition for his family members and within time even become a United States citizen. And that is completely inconsistent with the statute, so that cannot happen. But uh, we did offer uh, to pursue prosecutorial discretion. He indicated that he wished to go forward with the case. Thank you very much. Thank Mr. you, Your Honor. Mr. Mancini, you reserve some time for rebuttal. Just one more point, Your Honor. Uh, the, uh, Judge Harris asked if there were any regulatory exceptions to the statutory deadline. Indeed, there are not. However, there is a memorandum of understanding from Mr. Yates, who was the uh, then chief of these matters at then INS, which in fact expanded the class to include persons who were not the beneficiaries of labor certifications or immigrant visa petitions before April the 30th, 2001, after acquired spouses and children, which appear nowhere in the statute. And that, an, that, that would be, to me, a, an argument that this cannot be a statute of repose because they were not qualified. They, they simply were not at the time, on April 30th, 2001. The relationship didn't even exist. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. We will come down to council and take a brief recess.